Well, thank you, Dr. Butler Wu, and thank you, Dr. Rainey, and the department for inviting me to talk here today. So I'm going to talk today about strain typing in the clinical laboratory, not just the reference laboratory, and some strain typing methods that you may not have heard of in addition to pulse field gel electrophoresis, and then a little bit about our MRSA program and the VA and what we've been doing with our isolates down there. So what is strain typing in case you didn't know? Any method that can differentiate among bacterial isolates or other infectious agents. And this can either be on one side of the spectrum where we're just looking at the natural history or the taxonomy of an organism, or more specifically for epidemiological and outbreak surveillance and infection control. And in this case, the context is essential. You need to know where and from whom your organism came. And so just to give you a really relevant um, recent example of where strain typing would really come in handy is in case you haven't heard in the news, there was a case of bovine spongiform encephalopathy found in California. And if you're the FDA in charge of a multi-million dollar industry, it's nice to know if this is classical mad cow or if this is atypical mad cow. And in case you can't read that, it says, and you tell your friends it isn't mad cow disease anymore. It's beyond pissed off. Make a bleeping salad and leave us the bleep alone disease. <laughs> so when you really got to know, you got to know. And so this is great when this is a big deal and it's splashy and the resources are available to you. But in the clinical laboratory, molecular epidemiology looks a lot like this, where the questions aren't as splashy, not everybody needs to know immediately, you're trying to ask small, intelligent questions, and we're trying to get to the bigger bowl with a lot of resources that we don't have a lot of times. Techniques that are available for molecular epidemiology um, are on a broad spectrum, ranging from phenotypic phenotypic techniques like biochemical testing and serotyping, um, single site targets, all the way um, taking an exponential leap to whole genome sequencing and plasmid mapping. So the molecular strain typing methods uh, I'm going to talk about today are listed here. And I realize that an antibiogram is not technically a molecular technique, but I'm going to make a little bit of an argument for that on the next slide. So uh, if you're not familiar with the term antibiogram, it's an overall profile of an organism's susceptibility to a panel of antimicrobial drugs. And this can be either um, a conglomerate of multiple organisms, or you can actually generate an uh, antibiogram for a single organism. And that's how I'm going to talk about it um, in reference to today's data analysis. And I'm going to argue that you can use this as a phenotypic screen for some genetic determinants. We know more and more today about um, resistance mechanisms and their genetic um, determinants, and so that we can use some of these phenotypic um, tests as a surrogate for those. And in the past, these antibiotic susceptibility profiles have been used to classify Staphylococcus, where hospital-associated strains um, conventionally were thought to be resistant to multiple drug classes, and community-associated strains were typically resistant to the beta-lactams, although these categorizations and definitions really aren't accurate anymore. And we use this every day in the microbiology lab, and it's about a 24-hour turnaround time, just as long as it takes the organism to grow. Single-site targets for Staph aureus include things like the SCC MEC, the SPA, the SPA um, staphylococcal protein A gene, and the pa Panton valentine leukocytin gene, or PVL, as it's often referred to. And things to consider with these techniques are overall, although they're targeted and fast, um, a lot of um, these techniques have lower discriminatory power than other methods because they are such a targeted approach. And in the case of things like the SPA uh, gene, not every lab has access to a sequencer, so this might not be the best choice for your laboratory. Pulse field gel electrophoresis, or PFGE, is something most people are familiar with, and it's still considered the gold standard in the industry. However, most of the time this technique is performed at a reference laboratory because it is labor intensive and you need to have dedicated staff in general to, to perform this technique. And for staff worries specifically, the pulse field types have been um, divided into what's known as the USA groups 1 through 1200, and that's based um, on similarity depending on the band pattern. RET-PCR, repetitive element PCR, is a technique maybe you haven't heard about, so I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about how this works. And so either general conserved primers or species, I'm sorry, genus-specific primers can bind to many specific uh, repetitive sequences interspersed throughout the genome. 
generating multiple fragments of various lengths and quantities, and then they're separated by mass and charge by electrophoresis. And so this generates a unique rep PCR DNA fingerprint or a pro and a profile with uh, multiple bands of varying intensity. This system has been commercialized and it's called Diversa Lab. And the turnaround time for this system is generally less than 24 hours. And the separation of the amplified product is now done using microfluidics and detection of a fluorescent signal using an Agilent analyzer. And then Diversa Lab has a nice software package that comes with it that'll generate not only a virtual gel from your electrophorogram, but it'll do a dendrogram based on um, this pairwise proximity matrix that um, the system um, utilizes. And so this system allows you to look at the raw data, and you can see here the electrophorogram pattern, and these two patterns happen to be identical as opposed to these where you can see um, that one very large peak has disappeared and some of the others have diminished. So these are different. And for Staphylococcus aureus, a one peak difference is considered um, a, a difference in relatedness. And sometimes the analysis of the raw data is required to distinguish some strain types. The USA 300 and USA 500 strain types uh, in correlation with the pulse field typing um, differ in the RET PCR system by only one tiny little peak, and this has been consistently reproduced. So that isn't picked up by the software very well or the virtual gel. You have to look at the raw data. So there have been several publications in the literature regarding RET-PCR in comparison with pulse field. And this paper by Tenover um, looked, at, um, looked at the two and found good correlation with pulse field and that using Diversa Labs uh, strain typing library, you can classify your strain types into some of the larger uh, pulse field groups, USA 100, which was classically associated with hospital-associated strains, or the 300-500 type, which are more associated with the community-associated strains. And I say that loosely because those definitions really don't um, hold up anymore. It's just to give you some reference about what people are talking about. Technical skill is required, basic PCR skills, but if you have this uh, isolate already uh, separated, you can get turnaround time in less than four hours. And Tenover found that um, this technique was good to rule out related, relatedness, but ultimately pulse field is more discriminatory. Raman spectroscopy is the second technique, and this is molecular vibration through laser excitation. That's a huge mouthful, but basically what you're doing is hitting your um, isolate with a laser. And... Um, in the excitation of the photon, some of that energy is absorbed by the molecular bonds, and the emission spectra is then measured by the machine. So, the, And the difference between the excitation and the emission spectra, in the difference in the wavelength is called the Raman shift, and this can be measured and quantified. So each different um, molecular organizational group has a unique signature, and the software amalgamates that all into sort of a super spectra, which they call an optical fingerprint of the whole organism. So ultimately, this looks at seven, over 700 data points for each organism. And the turnaround time is 24 to 48 hours, depending on how long it takes to uh, isolate your organism and get that ready to go. Then you can compare the spectra of several organisms um, with one another. And the software does a nice job of um, doing that comparison for you. And unlike the Diversa Lab software, you can't look at each individual spectra compared to each other, but you can change some of the relatedness um, stringency criteria and alter some of the data analysis in, term, in terms of the clustering. So there is some um, user modification available. And what's been uh, looked at and compared with for Staph aureus is that this um, system also found good concordance with pulse field. They found few discrepancies. There, there was high throughput. You can get uh, analysis, analysis for 12 to 24 strains in about 90 minutes, so rapid data collection. It's low tech because you're only pipetting the organism. There's no extraction, but it's time sensitive. And because this is strain typing, it's media and growth condition dependent. So it depends what and how and how long you grow it. Um, and you can imagine because different um, molecular characteristics will be expressed depending on your growth conditions. Whole genome mapping, 
um, or optical mapping is done by the Argus system, and that's um, by Opgen. And so you can either have the system in your laboratory, you can send that to this company as a service. And what this does is, um, after a gentle extraction method, it takes the DNA molecules and stretches them out on a glass slide. So they're immobilized, and then they're digested with a, re a specific restriction endonuclease. Um, so you can see here the different cleavage sites in the DNA, and then the restriction fragment order is maintained. So this is basically pulse field electrophoresis on steroids. Um, the different fragments are stained, and then the, measurement, the measurements of different fragment sizes are captured um, by the machine. And then what the software does is it can take the overlapping single molecule maps and assemble them into a whole genome map. And Opgen says they like to have 30x coverage at each site, so 30 um, different maps at different cut sites before it generates the whole genome map. And you can see here at the bottom a representative cartoon of what an optical map would look like where the black marks demarcate the lines of restriction uh, digestion and in between are the um, unknown genetic elements. So the resolution for this technique is from 2 kb to 10 mega, megabases. Um, less than 2 kb is small fragment loss. Basically, those little pieces just don't stick to the glass and they wash away. And strands less than 150 kb, so plasmids and often things like viruses, just don't have enough cut sites to get effective analysis. So what I think is really interesting about this technique, what, where the real power of this is not only that it's um, in sequential order, but you can also take your strain that you have in your lab that you've generated an optical map and compare it to any strain that has um, genomic data out there um, on the internet. So it can take that data that's out there, generate an in silico map for you, and then you can compare. So you can see here a comparison of a strain with an in silico, in la a lab strain with an in silico strain, and it can find the differences. And you can see the little pictorial here at the bottom, the white regions indicate differences between the strains. And so since you know um, not only what the cut site sequence is, but the sequence on either side, you can then generate primers that can amplify the unknown site. And so you can essentially get a de novo sequence without, de no without um, whole genome sequencing. This technology has the ability to compare multiple strains at a time and can look for inversions. In this example, you can see insertions. And in this example, you can see multiple deletions compared to from the lab strain to the in silico strain. So gee whiz, that sounds like a lot of fun, but what do we do with this in the clinical lab? And so we um, uh, wanted to use a lot of these techniques to look at MRSA in our MRSA program, and that was started in 2007. We were mandated to roll this out, and it happened nationwide. Uh, it's a universal surveillance program for MRSA, and so what that consists of at the VA is universal surveillance, admit, transfer, and discharge for every patient at the VA. Patients get put in contact precautions. They're considered MRSA positive if they have any history of MRSA within the previous year, and we don't do um, targeted decolonization practices. And there was a recent New, uh, New England Journal article talking about um, some of the successes in the methodology of the program um, as a whole. And so that, argue, that article wasn't very specific to our institution, so we wanted to look at the data um, from our institution. We do over 20,000 um, MRSA screens a year, so it's a considerable amount of data. And bloodstream infection is a good um, marker for, um, for MRSA infection, so that's what we wanted to look at. And like many hospitals in the early 2000s, we saw a steady increase, although there's a dip here one year, I can't explain. We saw a pretty steady increase in the rate of MRSA bloodstream infection. Then we saw a decline um, that we really haven't attributed to, um, been able to attribute to anything special, and then um, a, con a continued decrease. And so I think a lot of people would like to jump up and down and say that this is attributable to our MRSA program, and so we wanted to look at a control, um, something like MSSA. And what we found is that um, the results really weren't uh, what we thought, well, weren't expected. This didn't turn out to be a good control. So the MSSA bloodstream rates 
uh, also have continued to decrease. And what I haven't shown you here, but is also relevant, is that so have the C. difficile rates and so have our ventilator-associated pneumonia rates. And so while I think um, the data are limited, I think they suggest that it's not necessarily what we've been doing specifically in the laboratory or what we've been doing specifically with contact precautions, I think the VA underwent culture change as a whole, and that's what's been um, contributing to our success. So hopefully we'll parse out the data a little bit more and um, find something interesting. So where did all this MRSA surveillance program stuff start? And started um, um, back in the 90s, this paper by Klutmans found that um, there was an increased risk for patients um, of infection who were colonized versus non-colonized. And then really this von Eif paper in the New England Journal um, demonstrated that greater than 80% of staph aureus isolates from the nose were clonally identical to those in the blood. So combined with the risk and the clonality, it seemed like having um, nares colonization definitely put you at risk for infection. And so with a steady increase in MRSA in wounds, and I think anybody who's worked a wound bench has seen um, a lot of times 50% of your isolates are MRSA, we wanted to ask, was that correlation the same for wounds? And so just a little bit of background of what's been published out there. Um, so in this, out, in this outbreak in a high school football team, they found a limited number of cultures were available, but where they did um, find them, they were identical. The nose and the wound were identical. Um, only a small percentage were nares positive overall, and we're talking like N of three. Uh, the Klutman's paper actually also looked at that, and 50% of patients that developed surgical site infection were also nares positive, and nares and wound isolates were identical for isolates available for analysis by phage typing, which isn't the most discriminatory method. It doesn't really give us um, really robust data analysis. Uh, the Chen paper looked at an outbreak um, in kids, and in patients with skin and soft tissue infection, only a limited number of nares positive for MRSA, but 60% of those were concordant by pulse field. And then this last paper talks about the outbreak um, in the professional football players um, that was with the Rams group, but none of those folks were nares positive for MRSA. So the data don't really give us a, the data that are out there don't really give us a good indication. So our study objectives were to look at, to ask whether the noses were the culprit for wounds and whether we could even make that conclusion with the methods that we had available to us. What are the best strain typing methods for Staph aureus? And does the method that we choose impact the result? You would expect it would, um, but we wanted to ask these questions. So our study comprised of 40 pairs of MRSA isolates, one from the nose and one from the wound. And I talked a little bit before about the context being important. In this case, we set our temporal correlation at less than 48 hours. We really wanted to try to get them as close together as possible. And we looked at these um, bugs using four methods, pulse field, the diverse lab rep PCR method, the spectra cell Raman method, and the antibiogram. And we asked this, a simplified question, is this the same, are the isolates the same, the pairs, are they the same or are they different? We didn't initially ask, um, are, do these methods um, put all the bugs in the same clonal groups? We just wanted to know how they dealt with the pairs. And so our results showed that by four methods, there were really a diverse set of groups. And you can see some of the different categorizations for each method here. And it breaks down into a big, wide, um, patterning like this, over 26 distinct groups depending on how it was classified by each method. And so the summary from the data, what we found were that um, almost 77.5% of the isolate pairs were concordant by all four methods, so really similar to what was found in the bloodstream data. Um, using pulse field and rep PCR only, 80% of the pairs were the same. And if we compare just pulse field and the Raman analysis, 75, 75 pairs were the same. Um, with all the methods in one bucket, only 68% of the paired isolates were the same. And so um, it looked like that pulse field and rep PCR had a little bit stronger agreement than SpectraCell did. But so we were left with a bucket of um, isolate pairs that weren't 
in agreement by all four methods. So now what? Because this is basically what's available to us. Pulse field is the reference method. And the other methods that are out there aren't really more discriminatory. And I'm really referring to multi-locus sequence typing, um, which is a little bit laborious, a little bit expensive. And we weren't confident that we were going to get a better answer than we already had. And whole genome sequencing was just not an option for us. So that's where we turn to OpGen. And so our uh, isolates that didn't agree by different methods uh, sort of broke down into these different categories. So um, only the spectra cell said the isolate was different. Number two, only the spectra cell said that the isolates were the same. And when I say same, I just want to make sure everyone's clear that I'm going to say indistinguishable. That doesn't mean there isn't a detectable difference, but when I say same, it just means our, they don't look different by any of the methods that we have. Um, only the diverse lab system said that the isolates were the same. More than one measure was discrepant, or only the antibiotic prof profile said that the two strains were different. And we chose not to look at um, continued analysis um, with OpGen using the antibiotic profile because a lot of the differences can be explained by single point mutations. So this is kind of a breakdown of the different analysis groups, and I've, I've sort of demarcated them in yellow where the isolate, um, the, the methods agree the isolate is the same, but the outlier says that they're different. The method, methods agree that the isolate is different and the outlier says they're the same. And a lot of these I put in reference with pulse field as the um, reference method. And then we also looked at two strains, two isolate pairs where the methods were concordant. So these were the isolates, isolate pairs that we chose to send on for further analysis roughly representing each one of the groups of our discrepants. And so I know that this dendrogram um, is difficult to read, but it's, you can get a general representation by where the patient pairs are. So remember, we get this nice optical um, barcode representation, and we can then look at the two pairs using this to detect differences. And then the software system will actually generate a really nice dendrogram, and we can use that. So where only the spectra cell indicated the two strains were different, um, the isolates appeared indistinguishable by optical mapping. So the spectra cell may have been overcalling um, in that case. Where diverse lab said that the, st the strains were the same and all the other methods said they were different, that should say they were indistinguishable. So in this case, the diverse lab um, did not have enough um, discriminatory power. Where more than one method was discrepant, this happened where rep PCR, the diverse lab system, and the antibiogram said that the isolates were indistinguishable, but pulse field and spectra cell indicated differences, and that was um, consistent with the optical map as well. We wanted to try a couple of strains where all methods indicated the strains were the same, and in this case, um, this, these two pairs, all the methods were the same, and also, the optical map didn't find any differences between the two. But in this case, um, the second set, um, the pairs did look different, although they were small. Um, the, and so the genetic differences um, were identified, and we're going to look a little bit more into that. So ultimately, this is how um, the resolution went for each pair. And the summary conclusions from that are consistent with what was found, um, some of what was found in literature. So ultimately it, looks, ultimately it looks like pulse field is the more discriminatory method, potentially followed by spectra cell. However, spectra cell has some variable specificity um, that can be adjusted by the user. And when we did this study, we did it with a collaborator who set that um, um, stringency, but we could potentially adjust that and potentially resolve some of these differences. Um, rep PCR is overall uh, less discriminatory, glumps more things into groups, but it um, works well for a rule out um, scenario, and it's really um, pretty handy to use in the lab. And the antibiogram remains a good first screen tool um, for strain typing. So before we make some conclusions about our NARIs and wound correlation, I want to throw one more little piece of data into the pot. And so we had 40 patients that we had both wound and NARIs for, but we wanted to also look at how many times did patients have a wound and also have a NARIs, but it was negative. So we could find in the same time period 33 of those patients. So 45% of the time, the patients with wounds, um, positive wounds were NARIs negative. So if you add in 
the four um, patient pairs that were agreed upon as the strains being different by the, all four of the strain typing methods, and then um, estimate about five, of the, five more additional pairs of the discrepance would have been resolved, um, basically using pulse field, um, as being different. Then overall, that leaves us about 42 um, patients, patient pairs, where the nares and the wound were not concordant. Either the strain types were different or the nares was negative. So that's uh, 57 over 57 percent. So overall, yes, the method you use makes a difference. And you would think that, um, but these methods are often used as the final word. Um, so you need to choose your method carefully. Yes, in most cases, when a patient has both a wound and a nares isolate, um, the majority of the time, and 80 per, about 80% of the time in our study, um, the two isolates were indistinguishable from each other. But no, the nares isolate may not be the best predictor of the risk for wound infection. So if we're using our nares isolate as the surrogate marker for a patient's um, uh, an indicator of their risk for future infection, I don't think the NARES um, is the best place to look. And because MRSA cl contains clonal relatedness, a large uh, amount of clonal relatedness, we need to keep looking for unique marker markers that are required to track isolates. So a couple of pieces of additional data that we've been able to um, um, look at in the lab using different techniques. And so remember the antibiogram, I said before, is a, it's a good screening technique. But what we found uh, were really interesting in these cases, um, we were able to identify two different populations where the antibiogram was actually tipping us off to something that might be going on. So in population one, we found a whole, cr a whole cluster of uh, isolates that had ele elevated MIC to tigacycline. Now we don't always we don't always test for tigacycline. Um, it didn't used to be on the Vitec panel. It is now. It happened to be in this um, panel that we were looking at. So it was kind of an odd catch, and it's not something that's routinely prescribed in our hospital. But we found a whole group of these bugs that were from the same hospital unit, and we could identify their presence in this unit for greater than a year. So we're going to start expanding out a little bit more and seeing if we can identify. Um, when that strain first came into our hospital. In the second population, um, we looked at pre- and post-mupiracin isolate. So patients who had an isolate pre-mupiracin therapy and patients who had an isolate post-mupiracin therapy. And I think what um, happens a lot of time in these decolonization practices is that a patient gets decolonization therapy, um, they're decolonized for a little while, then they become NARES positive again, and I think the assumption is that the um, that resistance was acquired. But what we looked at, and while the N is small, we found some interesting things. In one patient um, who had a post nary or post mupiracin strain, the strain um, was resistant, where his initial pre mupiracin strain was sensitive, but it was actually a different strain. And in the second patient. The initial strain was resistant. The post mupiracin strain was susceptible, but it was actually the same as a previous wound strain. So um, I think with some of these data, we've thought more about um, introducing more mupiracin susceptibility testing in the laboratory for clinicians who actually want to put their patients on targeted decolonization um, therapy. So things to think about, um, clinical implications for the hospital infection control programs. If you're really after targeting um, MRSA and doing search and destroy and you have high rates of wound infection, then I don't know if the NARES is the best place. And a lot of the European centers do multiple sites of surveillance, including the axilla, the groin. There's good evidence to show that you get a pretty good bump from throat culture. So some of these are... Um, not so invasive sites. Um, some of them are a little bit more uncomfortable, uh, maybe like a perirectal site. And a lot of these get pooled um, for diagnostics, so lots of things to consider. And then medical legal implications. I think more and more insurance companies are telling hospitals that they're not going to be reimbursed for hospital-associated infection, and they'll be looking, legal departments will be looking to the laboratory to say whether or not this isolate is a hospital strain or not. And just think about the limitations of some of these techniques 
um, whether or not they actually have the capability of doing that for you or not. And it's important to understand the limitations. So I'd like to thank the collaborators from this project, Dr. Claridge, uh, Marilyn Roberts, and S.O. Soj here at the University of Washington with the pulse field. Raman spectroscopy was done by River Diagnostics in the Netherlands, and optical mapping um, done by Aaron Newburn and Emily Zentz at OpGen. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we got a little bit of funding from GlaxoSmithKline and some support from OpGen on top of the resources provided by the VA. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. So we, um, we recently started doing throats, um, where we hadn't done throats before, and we saw that 30, we were catching 30% more people. But has anyone looked to see if the MRSA is different between the different sites? Have they looked at a patient that's positive, axilla, have they done that? They have done that, and I think there is, you can find diversity amongst a human, not usually within the same site, but you can carry a different strain in your throat and your groin. Um, but I think a lot of that has not been looked at. And also, what's the average price per specimen or per, per bug for the opt-in? Like for the opt-in? So if, if, you, if you just send it to them straight and it's a bug they know about, it's, they'll quote you anywhere between $1,000 and $3,000. If you wheel and deal, it can be cheaper. If you bring the system in-house, they say that the reagents are between $100 and $300. And I'm not a salesperson for opt-in, so that's not a quote. <laughs> so. Uh, I'll, I'll do it for a thousand. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm just curious. This 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 uh, VA wide screen program sounds like it was uh, you know a huge institutional project. Were there any huge. prospective criteria for establishing that the program was a success and like a decision point at which they decide that it's not working anymore and they should stop spending money on it, or is is that part of the definition of the program, or does that have an end point? The answer to your question, as far as I know, is no, no, and no. I think there was a huge spike in MRSA. It made the news. There was congressional pressure. This came down the pipe. This is my interpretation. Nobody lets me into those closed-door meetings. They had some preliminary data from um, Philadelphia that had had a high rate of infection. They put the system in place and showed really good results. but. Nobody asked ahead of time what the rate, what the baseline rate of infection at each, each, each institution was. So to ask, um, was the program effective? And then everybody was sort of left to pick their own method. So um, I think that's the part that, I, that I'm frustrated with the New England Journal paper because it shows overall, hey, we did great. And I don't want to say that we didn't because a lot of hard work of a lot of people went into that but there's not really a lot of data to support why. So as far as measuring outcomes data, I think it's very limited and very messy. So. What's the regulatory status of these different typing systems you discussed? You mean, are any of these FDA cleared? Yeah. No, these are all user figure it out. So all of these are research only. So we've done some types of validation based on kind of what we have, looking at um, known pulse field isolates, trying to standardize as much as possible. But you're pretty much out there on your own. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's okay. very difficult. I mean, because there's lots of software and interpretation. Of yes, points yes. Be a, a, an approval. And that's a, all, of the, all of these techniques have to be sort of taken with that in mind, um, the diverse lab is very sensitive to how good your extraction is. So how much you're putting out depends on what you get out. The Raman spectroscopy is very time dependent, although maybe it's a little bit wafflier than the company would like you to think. But they like a 20 hour time point with you. To ask me, it's a pain in the butt. So I, I don't love it. So. I think that first uh, passage in the laboratory in the presence of tigacycline selects resistant mutants with a population of uh, Okay. Um, so I'm planning to do that. So hopefully we will do some further characterization of these isolates. Um, but I was surprised to find them. Isn't it 
maybe the nares is not the best predictor of what you're going to have in the wound as far as that particular strain. But not infrequently, we'll have um, a patient that has a wound culture. We see GPCs, and so we let the ID team know that you know they had a positive MRSA screen. Yeah. And so, in terms of your antibiogram, did those things correlate whenever you see MRSA in the nares with MRSA in the wound, or did you ever? We say that again. You mean in terms of just the wound cultures, or? Yeah. So. Sort of, we if we and I've never went back and looked to see, you know, even though we tell them, well, the person's had a previous MRSA surveillance screen that's positive. Mm -hmm. So since they have GPCs in the wound, we're banking that it is probably going to be a methicillin. Resistant. Oh, I see. I see. Have you ever really looked to see if that holds true? I've never looked, so I don't know. Sort of a prospective. It's not the same, but at least the antibiogram portion of it may be more similar. No, because our MRSA screens don't usually get an antibiotic. Um, susceptibility panel. So in this case, we did that, um, but we don't have a lot of comparative data for nary screens versus what we have in wound infection. Th is that what you're asking me? Yeah, but you okay. only looked at MRSA resistant staph with, the, with these screens and the wounds as well. Right, so. right. Just targeted for this, right. Yeah. As part of your routine workflow, are, are you typing everything on the diverse lab, or is it only when you get requests for infection control and prevention, or and how yes. are they using that data? So we recently had um, an inquiry from infection control where they thought that um, they had spread of colonization from one, from one space to another in our, um, maybe in our community living center. And so we're using these techniques to, we have the diverse lab in-house, we don't have the spectra cell anymore. Um, to just rule out whether or not that happens. So if all of the strains look like they're the same uh, clone, we really can't say much because we know that the system isn't very discriminatory beyond, um, you know, within large clonal, clonal groups. But we could at least tell them whether or not um, that's not the case. And so they had the same inquiry for us, I don't know, about a year ago in our bone marrow unit. So we were able to look at that in a quick screen and say, no, none of these are related. So that, that's kind of the information that we can give them. And no, we're not using it um, for everything. That would be really expensive and cumbersome. So, yeah. So you, you mentioned the multi sequence uh, typing mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be discriminatory enough. And you alluded to you know, the, the great wish that we get a whole genome sequencing. So where in between those two methods do you think would you find sufficient discriminatory power? And, and if you could envision, like given the current prices of hyper sequencing platforms, like a, a reasonable pr approach to try? Yeah, I don't, hmm, that, I guess that would be hard to say. So what I didn't say, and I think what I would make the argument for, is that this opt-gen system is really a paradigm shift for strain typing. And if you could get that in your lab, and the price could come down, it may be a really competitive approach. And especially if it's a really big deal, if it's a true outbreak, then that's definitely the place to go. I think multi locus sequence typing um, is great because if you can get your sequencing costs down, then it's a competitive um, technique with pulse field, and then that's accessible and it's, of course, reproducible and kind of more adaptable to the clinical lab if you have the resources available. So, but I think there is a pretty big space between what we can get from OpGen and then what we can get from pulse field or multi locus sequence typing. And um, adding more single site targets onto that. I would imagine would give you some more um, discrimination, but you're just increasing your complexity and cost. So there's a space. I don't know how big it is. Um, have there been published studies uh, of whole -tone genome sequencing of various MRSA isolates? And if so, what is the sort of mean and distribution of the number of specific sequence site variations sort of over the whole genome among the different strains that have been looked at? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And I think people have looked at um, whole genome sequencing in a really targeted way. So they've used it for sequencing assembly or maybe one strain versus the other. But I haven't um, seen a very comprehensive overview of diversity done by optical mapping. I, I mean, as a follow-up question, I mean, I think the kinds of numbers that you're talking about in terms of uh, prices for the uh, that optogen or whatever it was is, is not that far off from, from sequencing. 
using whole genomes. Mm -hmm. So I think though that's changing very rapidly. So I think that I think it would be worth sort of asking the question, you know, how much more if if, if you get if the average number of sequence differences is a hundred over the whole genome versus you know some much smaller number of these things, then your ability to discriminate isolates would be correspondingly greater. So that that would need to be shown by the data, but it's right. theoretically possible. Yeah, it's an exciting time for molecular diagnostics in the lab. This is all becoming more accessible. Thank you very much.